Welcome to Hard Talk, I'm Stephen Sacker. Professional football has a problem with homophobia. There are gay footballers, but almost to a man, they feel compelled to keep their sexual orientation secret. The exception is my guest today. Robbie Rogers is a US international who plays for LA Galaxy. He broke football's great taboo by very publicly coming out after a spell in English football. Why haven't other gay footballers followed his lead? Robbie Rogers, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks. I want to begin with a very broad question. How different a person do you feel yourself to be today, two years or so after having come out, from the guy who as a young man felt compelled to keep this secret for so long? Yeah, uh, c completely different, you know, short answer. Um, I was very depressed, isolated, and, and out of touch with my emotions. And you know, winning a championship in 2008 with the, the Columbus Crew, I could enjoy it, but not really uh, fully, I guess, like seize the moment. And when we won, you know, a few weeks ago with LA Galaxy, I was you know, brought to tears and sharing with my family. And after the game, went to go celebrate with my teammates. And um, I don't know, I, I, I just a totally different person. You've talked about, in a sense, being afraid for so much of your life. Yeah before you came out. And I just wonder, what, what was the basis of that fear? What were you frightened of? I think it was a, a combination. Uh, I come from a very conservative Catholic family where you grow up thinking that like, being gay is not a good thing. And then I also grew up in, in the sports world where you know, on a daily basis you hear different homophobic things, words being used. And, and uh, you know, I, I, there's banter and I'm fine with that, but then it gets to a point where it's like just goes too far. So. I was afraid and, and kind of scarred as a youth to think that uh, if I ever accepted that side of myself, if I ever shared that side of myself, that I would be um, uh, almost like disowned. So if we think about Robbie Rogers, the, the kid, and, and yeah. you were a, a sort of standout footballer at, yeah. at school, and I guess by junior high and high school it was clear yeah. that you had a pretty special talent. Yeah. Were you saying to yourself, you know, I, I'm a real star athlete, but as a result of that, even if I'm beginning to feel I might have a sexual orientation which is homosexual yeah. rather than heterosexual, I've got to keep a lid on that. Yeah. You know, was that the way you were beginning to think? Yeah, it was when I was around 13, 14 that I realized, like I was playing for the youth national teams and realized like, oh, this is what I, what I want to do. And I'd started watching Arsenal play and different mm -hmm. players and, and um, you know, so I realized that there were no gay athletes out there. There was no one for me to look up to. There was, uh, you know, it was a very macho sport of, you know, heterosexual men. So I thought that's what I had to be. And when I realized I was gay, I was like, well, I can't do this. <laughs> you, you literally said to yourself, I've got to make a choice here. If yeah. I want to pursue the football yeah. and try and make it a career, yeah. I am going to have to suppress my real identity. Yeah, yeah, there was that side. And then there was also, again, my, my family that I was worried about. So it was like the perfect combination just to create this, uh, I don't know, just to keep me closeted mm. for a long time. So leaving aside football altogether, th there was no way you felt you could tell your family at the no, time? No, no, definitely not. Because they would have... Yeah, like, I mean, the kind of discussions that were going on in my house were, you know, let's say same-sex marriage came up, you know, in California. Um, they would be totally against that. They were. Now it's totally different. Now that, you know, they had the personal experience and have me in their life, they can't wait till I get married. Hmm. But back in the day, they, you know, would talk about that in the house, and I knew that they weren't supportive of it, so... Uh, you know, obviously I felt like I was in an environment where I could be gay. You've written a lot about your uh, upbringing and your youth in, in your memoir, Coming Out to Play, and I just wonder if it's been hard for your family to read some of the stuff, particularly the way in which you felt you couldn't confide yeah. in them and be open with your yeah. own mother and father and siblings yeah. for so many years. Yeah, I mean, they've all said to me they were, they're really sad and, um, and they just, they wanted to be able to help me through those times, you know, and, and they're sad that I felt like I couldn't tell them and I couldn't share that with them. Because that's the last thing you want in the world is for your kid to go through something so depressing, you know, by themselves. So, 
um, you know, I've heard from everyone in my family that, that, that they wish and that I wish that I could have felt comfortable in doing that. Mm. It, your career went off very well. I mean, you, you joined Columbus Crew, I think, at the time, one of the best MLS yeah. uh, US Soccer League teams. I think in 2008, when you were still a very young man, yeah, you 21. won the MLS Cup. Yeah. It is interesting, and you've reflected on this a little bit already in this interview, that even though you were having great times, and even though football is such a team sport, you felt a bit like yeah. an outsider. And that's kind of what made me come out eventually. I was going through these moments that I dreamed of, going to the Olympics, having my first cap for the national team, winning a championship and all that stuff, and I wasn't happy, and I was so depressed, and I'd go home thinking like, like, why, why am I not happy? Like, I thought that this was going to kind of mask that that uh, that homophobia that I almost had towards myself. You know, I thought that was going to mask this stuff, this depression. And um, it's an interesting phrase you just yeah. used. Was there a point, even in your late teens and early twenties, where you still tried to convince yourself you might not be gay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like dated girls and thought that I might. <laughs> it's crazy when I look back at it, but I thought that you know, if I'd meet the right girl, that would like change me somehow. I mean, it's absolutely insane looking at my letters, my diaries, and and saying things that I sent to people. But um, you know, I was just you know, I didn't share that with anyone. So I had all these weird internal mm -hmm. thoughts and thoughts that uh, somehow I could change myself or somehow um, I could just live this life of of being. Uh, very internal with all my emotions, all right. um, which is dangerous. I mean, a lot of kids uh, that I hear from um, and become suicidal or, you know, have uh, lives that are just very depressing because they're so afraid to share, you know, who they are. Well, you talk about suicidal. I'm, yeah. It makes me mindful of an interview I did not so long ago with the Welsh rugby star player, yeah. Gareth Thomas, who was a hero in Wales. Yeah. And it's a pretty macho game, as you know. Yeah. Um, he was gay, he knew he was gay, yeah. but for a long time he couldn't come out even to his family, yeah. uh, certainly couldn't come out while he was still playing, he did afterwards, but he said to me in the studio, he said there were points where he was so low, yeah. he felt suicidal. Yeah. I mean, uh, how low yeah, at when, your worst? Yeah, and I write about it in the book, but uh, when I was living in Holland, when I first turned pro, that was like my moment where I was just like, you know, it might, not, it might be easier just not to be alive. And I mean, what an awful thing to like think and, and to let, you know, mm -hmm. go through your mind. Um, but I was just so depressed and, and thought it was just never going to be possible again for me to, to come out. So um, I know how it feels. Let's talk about um, homophobia. Because hmm. frankly, there's no other word for it. Yeah. In, in football, there is still a culture which, you know, some, in, in the mildest uh, way of putting it, might call a lad culture. But others would just say is out and out homophobic. Yeah. And, and you have had to, for years, watch that yeah. and be in the midst of it yeah, and yeah. be completely silent about your own sexual identity. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's banter, which, you know, you're not too sensitive to and, and you know, it flies around and whatever. It's always going to be part of the sports culture. But then there's a, a point where it gets past that, where, uh, you know, it's, there's like a malicious tone to it where, uh, and I've spoken about this, but where guys will like have a discussion. I've been in a locker room where guys have a discussion, like, how could you even be gay? How could you go through the act of loving them? Like, how disgusting is that? And I'd be riding the bike there, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, like, I'm never coming out. This is impossible. Or I am, but I'm definitely not going to be in this locker room. <laughs> so there's definitely, uh, you what know. What about that, coaches as well? Cause yeah, same. I just, oh, same. I, I've heard coaches say things like, don't pass the ball like a faggot. It's like, oh, what does that mean? Like, you know, I'm passing a ball now like everyone else, and I'm gay. So, um, but, but it's, that's I mean, stuff. You, if you were in a training session, yeah. and uh, if you literally heard yeah. a coach say, don't pass like a faggot, yeah. were you ever tempted to march up to that coach <laughs> and say, do you want to know something? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, there were, there were late, like, in the end, towards the more of the end of my career, I remember I heard it once, and, like, I actually left and after training and like laughed about it because I was like how insane that this person would say something and like believe that and think that it was acceptable to do that uh, and I was out with one of my buddies then so I was talking to them and I was like I, it's hard for me not to like just see how ridiculous it is mm -hmm. um, so you know when I was younger and I heard things like that I would just go internal and just be you know more depressed I guess and keep that stuff inside which again is so dangerous for people in, in, in your book, you've used that phrase, which is a very powerful phrase. You've talked about a pack mentality yeah. in, in, a, in a male. Yeah. I mean, obviously, many females play soccer, yeah, but if yeah. we're talking about you know, elite level yeah. professional male soccer, 
the pack mentality is as pretty much as strong today, despite all of the talk about yeah. r removing discrimination yeah. from the game, it's as strong today as it ever was. Yeah, uh, it's a little different now, I think. I think people are more sensitive to things. I know the Galaxy, it's, it's different. But yeah, that pack mentality where guys say things to make guys laugh, they say things because they think they're supposed to say them, that they're supposed to all agree on things, you know, they don't want to stand out too much. Um, you know, that is something that I don't quite understand. Um, you know, obviously I'm a person that like kind of goes a different way and I did definitely when I turned 25, but even before then, I've always been a person I think that uh, not necessarily, you know, always wanted to stand out, but I'm not afraid to disagree with people. Mm. And for whatever reason, I think maybe it's not just in sports, but it's just people in general, just um, become part of that mentality and that pack mentality. I say that they want to live up to stereotypes. They want to um, say things to have people agree with them. And, and I learned that because you know, I noticed after I came out, the same guys that were very homophobic before I came out, were the same guys that were supporting me and like, oh, I hope I didn't say anything in the locker rooms that, so that scared you or hurt you and you shouldn't retire, you know, you should keep playing. And so it's not that they're homophobic, it's just, again, that they're part of that like mentality. It's a culture. It's a culture, An exactly. unthinking sort of culture. Exactly, exactly. Well, let, let's continue the sort of